With Yahoo's surprise announcement of a new CEO, investors are eager to see how Marissa Mayer does in her first day on the job. I'm Louise Story, reporting for Business Day Live. We have an interview with former New York Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch, who is releasing a report today with Paul Volcker on the state of the municipal market. We've also got an IMF economist standing by to talk about the global economy. And we'll delve into the Senate's report on money laundering at HSBC with Johnny Frank, a fraud expert and former prosecutor. But first, we're joined by Laura Holson, a reporter here at the Times who spent a lot of time with Marissa Mayer while writing a profile of her a couple years ago. Hi, Laura. How are you this morning? I'm great. You know, I was looking back at your profile, uh, mm -hmm. Marissa, from just a couple years ago, and the lead of your story was all about rumors back then that she might leave. Well, I think Marissa is the type of person that she's, she's very smart, and she knows she wants to do many things in life. So I think back then she was kind of dabbling, if you will, and thinking about what she, what she was going to do. But I doubt anybody expected that she would become the CEO of, of Yahoo yesterday. It's a huge move. Tell us, I mean, how did she get to Google? What's her background? You know, she's from Minnesota. She's, you know, kind of a small town uh, girl, if you will, who went to Stanford and studied um, uh, computer programming. And she was recruited by Google as its 20th employee, you know, right out of school. She was their first female engineer. Yes, she was. But what, you know, she coded for, for a bit, but what she, they quickly learned, what her talent was, was design. And so if you look at Google and you see the, you know, the white background, the bright colors, it's all really Marissa. I mean, she really was their architect, if you will, of, you know, how Google would look and feel. And that's really her biggest accomplishment there. When people walk, you know, when they look at that company, that's also what she Also the background did. on the Gmail, the look there, Google Doodles. A, a lot of the design aesthetic really is Marissa's look and feel. So how yes. will she take that to Yahoo? Because obviously she can't make Yahoo just look exactly like Google. No, she definitely can't do that. But what she has is discipline. And uh, to give you just kind of an example of, um, of something that she, they dealt with back, uh, back then when I was reporting uh, the story, Google, they, the designers are trying to figure out what kind of blue they wanted for a background for a Google tool, toolbar. And so she made them go through this exercise of looking at 41 different gradations of blue. Kind of drove everybody a little bit crazy, but it was all about getting clicks and what was going to, going to uh, make the user kind of react. And that's the kind of thinking I think she can bring to so Yahoo. So she's very quantitative. It's not just interior design, what color does she like? It's also <laughs> testing it, making sure it gets yes. the clicks. It's all about the data. And I think that that's where she'll be helpful at Yahoo is because they have enormous sums of data that no one has really known what to do with. I mean, they, are they a media company? Are they a data company? I just think they've kind of floundered around through, as we know, multiple CEOs. So maybe she can help bring She's some. She's like their sixth CEO in five years, if you count the interim yes. CEOs. They can't make up their mind. And another thing that's interesting yes. about Yahoo is almost all of their board members are new since the beginning of this year. So they're really kind of, yes. you know, the founder of Yahoo, Jerry Yang, he dropped off the board. So they're really starting from scratch with Marissa. Well, it's kind of a, if you think about it, it's kind of a win-win for her because so many people have, you know, kind of failed before. If it doesn't work for her, you know, no, you know, nothing lost. But if she does manage to you know, bring them back into public, public consciousness, see them as an alternative to Google, it'll be a real win for her. I mean, it's going to be interesting watching her there more than Yahoo, if you will. That's right. Yeah. Um, and now, just, you know, just to note, out of the Fortune 500 companies, um, she'll be the number 20 female CEO, and uh, she also disclosed yes. yesterday that she's pregnant. That's unusual for a CEO coming in to, to be pregnant. So how will this go, to, go on for Yahoo? Well, I, I kind of think that the board probably just didn't care. I mean, they really wanted her. And, you know, if she comes pregnant or not, I mean, does it really matter today if someone is pregnant or well, not? Well, the way Marissa put it was she said it really shows their evolved thinking, and, and, and it seems like it does. Well, she's also very driven, and she's extraordinarily organized. So I can't imagine her not being able to kind of juggle. It may be a little bit difficult in the beginning, but not a I wouldn't imagine that she can't juggle that. You're not going to bet against her. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. The International Monetary Fund lowered its expectations for global growth yesterday. We're now joined from Washington by Thomas Helbling, the IMF's head of its World Economic Studies Division. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Louisa. So no one was surprised at all yesterday when the IMF came out and you all said that um, you're downgrading the global outlook because we've had so much negative economic news lately. Um, you describe uh, that there's been a loss of momentum for the global economy in the report. So can you tell us 
why that loss of momentum has occurred and why now? Um, the loss of momentum has a number of factors. I think uh, as in the recent past, it has been that the situation really hasn't fully turned around in Europe. That's one factor. And second, uh, the slowdown in emerging economies continued a bit more. Now, the setbacks in Europe, you know, there was uh, the run-up to the Greek elections, a lot of uncertainty, the banking uh, problems in Spain uh, became prominent. There was a bit more general doubt, A, about the willingness of governments to proceed with the reform programs and also about the willingness of their partner countries to help. So that there was a temporary increase in the second quarter and that took its toll on uh, growth in the euro itself. So now let me ask you, you describe, you describe a few risk factors that can make the global economy even worse. And one of the ones that you say is that we've got this fiscal cliff coming in the U.S., meaning that if there is a pullback in the policies in the U.S., if there, you know, if taxes go up, um, that it, it, the report says it could be a risk to the economy. But what can the IMF do um, to influence U.S. policy? Do you all have any sticks? I mean, can you? Is there anything you can really do to influence the U.S. on this? Well, it's mostly uh, arguing, convincing people that uh, the fiscal cliff, as we call it, is that the legislation, both on the expiring tax cuts and expenditure cuts as a quester, would imply in 2013 massive fiscal of adjustment uh, of about four percentage points of GDP. That would lead, if implemented in one year, such massive uh, fiscal adjustment would lead to basically output stalling, growth uh, going to zero. And if the U.S. growth from about 2% currently goes, would go to zero, that would, of course, uh, influence the growth momentum in the global economy. So you just have so, persuasion. You really just have persuasion in the U.S., but in Europe, IMF has been providing money for some of these emergency loans to Greece and to Portugal. Just yesterday, you dispersed more money to Portugal. Does the IMF have more influence over the situation in Europe? Uh, can you withdraw the loans, for instance? Or what can you do to um, influence European policy? Well, the, the influence in, in, in a program, you're partner with the country, you uh, discuss policies. Clearly, there's more direct influence. In what we call surveillance more generally, it's about uh, arguments. It's about uh, being a forum for policymakers. So at the annual meetings, at the spring meetings, uh, the IMF brings finance ministers, central banks, governors to, together and fosters discussion. I'm providing arguments, analysis, and uh, support and peer pressure you can have an influence on the, on the debate, make people ask the right questions, look at the implications of actions, and so the IMF has some influence. And what economic factors are you going to watch most closely over the next few months as you put together your next um, Global Outlook report? Right. What, what factors? So, mm -hmm. you know, Go ahead. So, sorry? I'm just curious what economic factors you're going to watch most closely in the coming months. Well, we, the most, as we emphasize in the World Economic Outlook, the most imminent risk is still uh, the crisis in the euro area. So what we will uh, follow closely is what policymakers will do and follow up on implementing the uh, agreements in principle at the EU Leaders Summit. So one key agreement there was the agreement in principle on banking union. And, the co and there, the first step was a common supervisory mechanism. So this mechanism has to be developed uh, over, according to the timetable, next half year. That agreement in principle on a, uh, or the agreement then on a common supervisory mechanism is also the precondition for the bailout fund, the European uh, Stability Mechanism or ESM, to provide fund or direct funds for the recapitalization of uh, Spanish banks. So that's one element we that will follow closely. That sounds like that's closely. a big one. Well, we'll all be watching Europe very carefully. And thanks so much for joining us, Thomas. OK, thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. The Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations is back in the news today. That's the committee chaired by Senator Carl Levin from Michigan that held that famous 11-hour Goldman Sachs hearing a couple years ago. Today, their target is the bank HSBC. 
I'm joined by Johnny Frank, a former U.S. prosecutor and now a partner at the Stone Turn Group to talk about the committee's focus on money laundering. Hi, Johnny. Hi, good morning. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So, um, you've looked at the report. Yes. And um, what's really interesting is that they're really singling HSBC out. And in your experience, is HSBC unique in its money laundering pro practices? No, not at all. Uh, the, the, the report talks about HSBC being a, a case study as opposed to HSBC being a, a particularly problematic bank. And, and in fact, some of the predecessor banks uh, that HSBC acquired in the United States, like uh, Republic, uh, actually had very well-regarded anti-money laundering programs. Well, that's interesting. You, you, put, you point to HSBC's predecessor banks. One of the things the report says is that HSBC bought these U.S. banks really primarily to give its foreign customers access to the U.S. You know, HSBC right. is a huge bank. They're based in Hong Kong. And so um, some of the practices this describes has to do with how they let foreigners transfer money in, money out. Um, let me ask you, does the U.S. government, ex I mean, how much burden do they put on banks to monitor this money coming in? Increasingly more and more so. I, I call it the privatization of, of law enforcement. You know, 25 years ago, money laundering was not even a, cr a crime. So what, wait, so what was money laundering before it was a crime? Before, well, the way they would uh, prosecute, the way money launderers would be prosecuted would be as aiders and, and betters of a particular crime, as if they were driving the car to the a bank robbery, I if you will. I see. Um, and then in the mid-1980s, that was realized that that was not going to be powerful enough, so they actually made a specific crime called money laundering, which, which we never uh, had. And, and what's unique about the money laundering uh, type of statute, although we also have this beyond banking, is that the corporation is required under law to be looking out for misconduct by others as opposed to merely not engaging in crime themselves. It's, it's akin, if you will, to my driving around in, in a car and, and the government saying to me, well, I need to look for other intoxicated drivers and report them if I see an intoxicated driver on the highway, as opposed to myself not being intoxicated. And a lot of this came to be after September 11th, right? We had the Patriot Act of 2002, That's right. which put a lot more burden on banks to report what's called a suspicious activity to the government. And if banks don't do it, they get in quite a lot, a lot of trouble. Yes, that would be a, that would be a crime un, unto itself. In, in parallel with this theme of, of what I call privatization, has also been the evolution of data analytics, because what's unique about well, what's, what's unique about the banking world and, and some other industries is just the sheer volume of transactions that, that go through. So if you think about it, it's somewhat magical to, uh, that a bank could have all these transactions going through and yet somehow being able to pick up which of the ones uh, might involve money laundering. Uh, the so-called data analytics behind that is, is similar to the same sort of data analytics that you experience if you use your credit card mm -hmm. in an unusual way. All those transactions. That's so one right. of the things that's really interesting about the Senate report, and you know there will be testimony all day long today, which I'll be watching. It'll be really interesting. Is they talk about all these different subsidiaries of HSBC. So they've got HSBC US. They've got 470 branches or so. But then they've got you know for instance HSBC Mexico. Right. And the report describes the interactions. Tell us about you know what the concerns are about HSBC Mexico and HSBC. US. Yes. So on, on the one hand, HSBC and other large multinationals are like a big bowl of fruit, if you will, and each entity is its own separate piece of, of fruit. Uh, sometimes the government looks at those same entities as, as a piece of, as a stew and everything is all, all, all mixed together. Uh, in this particular case, the, the, the concern was that HSBC Mexico, that, that, that uh, money laundering was coming from HSBC Mexico, and that the, the concern in the Senate report is that HSBC United States did not do a what's called a diligence investigation of, its, of itself. Well, in fact, U.S. law says that U.S. chartered banks and HSBC U.S. is a nationally chartered right. bank here, that they are responsible for doing due diligence on all of their related foreign affiliates. And the report says that they let in, you know, billions of dollars from Mexico, you know, which could be related to drug money um, unchecked. Yes, that, that's exactly it. And, and I think there's an intuitive thing for, for the banks, M meaning it's one thing if you or I go to HSBC to open up a bank account and they want to know, well, who are you? Um, I don't think it was intuitive 
for HSBC to do it, a diligence investigation of itself. Itself. Meaning. But, you know, HSBC Mexico was taking this money. The other thing, there's a lot of foreign policy in this re report also. They talk about money from Iran That's coming right. in um, through HSBC, coming into the U.S. through some kind of transaction called a U-turn transaction where they right. managed to wipe Iran's name off. Um, what other countries come up? Um, well, all of the embargo countries, wh whether it be uh, uh, Cuba, uh, uh, Iran, of course. Saudi Arabia came up with some concerns about terrorist financing. Yeah, Saudi Arabia came up in a, in, a, in a different way, which was that HSBC had a relationship with a, with a Saudi bank, uh, which was linked to terrorism. And what was interesting about that particular piece of the report was that HSBC had, disc U.S. had discontinued the relationship. And according to the report, there was so much pressure from the foreign affiliates of HSBC that they resume the relationship uh, after a while. Again, if you think about it as this bowl of fruit, if you will, it's the apple putting pressure on the on the orange because there are different entities uh, that are trying to make trying to make money. And unlike credit card fraud, where the where it's the banks that get hurt, um, in the anti money laundering area particularly the foreign banks, uh, you know, view this as just a delay and hindrance, if you will, of doing uh, Well, business. it's the tension between, you know, sometimes national security and crime versus ease of global financial transactions. Thanks so much for joining us, Johnny. Thank you. This morning, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, and former Lieutenant Governor of New York, Richard Ravitch, will release an extensive report on the problems in state and city finances and what to do about it. I sat down last week with Richard Ravitch, who long played a huge role in New York finance, to discuss these issues. American cities are running out of money. Finding revenues in the steep recession. The city council decided to file for bankruptcy. Negotiations with its creditors failed. So there's a lot of cities and states out there that have major budgetary problems. And people are looking around and saying, how did my town get into such a financial problem? Uh, we made a lot of commitments. We were optimistic about the availability of resources. And we made commitments that we can't pay for at today's level of resources. More and more transactions uh, occur on the internet and consequently escape sales tax trans uh, purchases. Yes. Gas taxes, which was another significant source, particularly to finance infrastructure. So therefore, as people have been buying more and more fuel-efficient cars, gas tax revenues haven't grown. Now let's talk about how state and local governments get their money. I mean, how do they pay for things? They've got a few things. They have sales tax. They've got personal income taxes in some states, corporate business taxes in some states. And then they've got property tax. And that is one that is related to some of the troubles we're in, right? Because the property tax is tied well, to the value of housing. All local governments depend on property taxes as their chief source of revenue. Is the property tax the best tax to finance uh, all the things that government does? And that's not necessarily true. The, the honorable people can disagree. But a lot of people think that a, a graduated income tax uh, uh, or a, a VAT uh, is a far more effective Than the property uh, tax. Yes. The decisions that you are making tonight are effectively throwing a grenade in my life. Well, and of the course, you know, purposes. we've had a few cities that have declared bankruptcy, and there has been a sort of panic around the municipal market because people say, well, we don't know how to really know the state that city budgets are in. I mean, do you think we had San Bernardino recently in California, several in California. Do you think we'll see a lot more bankruptcies? I hope not. Uh, I think what's happening in California is that the state of California is cutting uh, expenditures in a lot of programs, thus putting even greater pressure on local government, and local government doesn't have the resources uh, to pay for them. But you've also seen referendum in San Diego and San Jose, which would modify pension obligations to their employees as a serious effort to try to mitigate the enormity of their budget deficits. Uh, so we see a, a bankruptcy in Stockton, but uh, maybe some hope elsewhere. But every city in this country is feeling an increasing squeeze from a, a resource point of view. And you can find their report on our website when it's released later this morning. 
That's all for today. Please stay with us online at nytimes.com for our continuing coverage. I'm Louise Story, reporting for Business Day Live. Thanks for watching. Thank you.